So again, that question is, does it make it cheaper, faster, or easier for our customers to make progress in their lives? So when, you know, when, when I look at, say, 2016, 2017, and I think about like, you know, uh, our roadmaps, and certainly I'm sure you're all thinking about your roadmaps, there's a few trends I'll just go through maybe uh, that we've been observing that you know, will have ramifications for you, kind of whether you like it or not, because you don't get to pick the future. First one is like the consolidation of the enterprise. So we used to have these bloated like multi-CD desktop software products, and then frameworks like Ruby on Rails and you know, uh, Django and all that came out, and everyone made a very curious choice. They sliced off a very small piece, a minimum viable product of specific parts of these tools, and they released them as individual products. So when once you had an accountancy suite, now you have time tracking and invoicing and payments processing and four or five other products. And that would be fine, except for all these things that we threw up there don't necessarily interoperate. So now to get, for someone to get their job done, instead of using one product, they might use seven or eight. Uh, because all of these things, you know, they're all interlinked. And this is a very sort of intercom-like notion, because when we were talking about like, how can we explain what intercom does, our CEO drew a whiteboard diagram or something like this and sort of explained, like, you know, intercom, like, you know, this is the world, if you like, before us. And it was like, there's all this different data. And the dream of Web 2.0 was that we'd spend the best part of our years writing, you know, API to API connections so that all this shit could talk to each other. Of course, that doesn't happen because you've got better things to do. Um, so we, we figured we, we could position Intercom as being the anti of this, right? And we sent something like this over to our brand design team, who are way better at diagrams than I am at Keynote, and they produced this. And this became the sort of iconic, if you like, Intercom image for quite a while. And we still have versions of it today. Uh, now, what's interesting is this problem wasn't a unique thing to Intercom. This diagram, when we released it, was. Um, but a curious thing happened. We're like, oh, that one looks familiar. Builder, do something, except for, for them, it's resumes and networking and online presence. I'm like, OK, fair enough. And they certainly, you know, we saw a few more. They got kind of, obviously, they got a little bit wackier along the way. Um, and we're like, all right, um, maybe, maybe this is just a general trend. And we just happen to, like, to have like, the iconic diagram for this trend. And then these days, I actually can't go online without seeing this damn thing. You know? <laughs> it just keeps happening, right? So I'm saying all this to say that clearly this is a trend that people, uh, this is a problem people are experiencing. This idea that we have over-fragmented when we went to the cloud, and a lot of workflows have become disjoint across too many different areas. So, a que so what does this mean for you? Well, the question you have to ask is, does consolidating our tools make it cheaper, faster, or easier for customers to make progress in their lives? Specifically, like, is the ease of consolidation, i.e. having this uh, sort of centralized place, better than the benefits you'll get from such specificity by using single purpose tools for every single thing? If it is, you should really think about the implications of that. Or a related one is, like, are there adjacent workflows? Like, do people, the very second they leave your product, do they jump somewhere else to, to continue what they were doing? If so, someone's going to eventually connect those dots. And if it's not you, you should be in trouble. Uh, similarly, dear customers frequently jump from product to product just to get one task done. Like, does paying an invoice involve having five tabs open and like and an iPad over here and shit? Or, or, or is there a singular way to get it done? So that is the trend. The, the enterprise is consolidating again, and there will be repercussions. Uh, I firmly believe we'll see a lot of this. All those companies, like, sure, a lot of them will die, such as the nature of startups, but a lot of them are going to succeed too. And, I, you know, and just in case you're ever wondering, the li limit for like items on a keynote slide is 80. Otherwise, I would have like 300 of those diagrams for you. Um, so, another trend that's popular today is, uh, and it's just it's kind of it goes through this like sort of love hate cycle with the media is AI, and AI is like kind of everyone's favorite whipping boy in a lot of ways. Uh, but like, uh, I you know I once recently tweeted this on Valentine's Day because obviously that's what you do on Valentine's Day. Uh, and I said, like, I'm increasingly convinced that most startups that boasting about AI are just you know, really impressed with 183 if-else statements. Because that's kind of what it feels like, basically, a lot of the time. Um, AI hasn't really, it, I mean, even today, it still hasn't delivered what we were promised, right? Uh, now, it has delivered some cool shit. Uh, for example, I saw a robot that can put lipstick on a lady perfectly. Uh, here it is. <laughs> it can also wake you up early in the morning as well, which is pretty handy. 
But my favorite piece is after it wakes you up, it can actually make your breakfast for you, which is probably the best piece it has. <laughs> it's like, well, it's <laughs> that that kind of always feels like the future that we're fighting for, doesn't it? <laughs> like, um, but it, it is genuinely getting somewhere. Like so, like uh, a car company re recently released this video, uh, and you know what it shows is obviously a car pulling up, uh, projecting passenger sort of or pedestrian crossing, and letting pedestrian cross. And they finish this video and it fades to black. And the question is simply, is this a concept video? And you're like, oh, well, of course it's a concept video. Answer, well, actually, it wasn't. And you're like, oh, shit. So maybe this stuff will come. And I genuinely believe in the, in the case of like, uh, self-driving cars, uh, it is definitely going to happen, for sure. That's not really up for grabs. The most common re retort you get is like, oh, well, it won't be as good as me as a driver. And I was like, one, you're probably a shit driver. But two, uh, <laughs> but two like, it just needs to be better than the average for it to make sense. Yes, your AI is not going to paint like Picasso, but neither does anyone here, you know? It just needs to be better than the average. And like, there's all these sacred cows people in the AI field used to point to. The, mo the most obvious one was this uh, game Go, which was like the last sort of hallmark of humanity's intellect. And, uh, and this year, Go was uh, the human grand master was defeated by uh, Google's AlphaGo, uh, which is basically a lump of code. Uh, and uh, that's it. We're done. <laughs> yeah. um, but like the implications here is that if there's a task that can be expressed as, to a machine as basically input and your desired output, then it'll get near perfect immediately because computers can learn in seconds what takes us our entire lifetime. They can read libraries while we're tweeting a single tweet. And the best part is they don't even need to read libraries. They have all their friends who can read libraries and they can network with them and they can get all the same information. <laughs> That's like they have all these cruel advantages that humans will just never have. And then the other retort you'll hear a lot is like, well, how is it going to learn off me? I'm really good at Photoshop. And it's like, well, did you ever think that when you're using Photoshop, you might actually be teaching it what it is to do? And they're like, oh, yeah, OK, so what should I do? And I'm like, nothing. It's the future. It's happening. I deal with it. Um, but like the, the key idea here is that for many tasks, we're going to learn that good enough immediately for free beats the old world good enough immediately for free. And the questions that you should consider then is like, does AI or machine learning make it cheaper, faster, or easier for your customers to make progress in their lives? And if so, there's repercussions for you. Does your product have a set of data that a machine could learn from? And if so, you need to start learning from it. And if not, you better hope your competitors don't. Or can you observe current user interests and behaviors and from that, help future users so that they don't have to jump through the same hoops as the previous people. If you can, it's going to be a fantastic world for your, for your next users. If you can't, your next users aren't showing up for you. They're showing up somewhere else. So that, that's another trend is AI. A third one that's really popular at the moment is uh, messaging and bots. They're kind of connected. I kind of think the reason there's a buzz here is because like, bots are kind of the intersection of messaging, which is itself a mega trend, and AI, which we just covered, is also a huge trend. So bots kind of sit in the middle. But to talk about messaging for a second, like what's going on with messaging is pretty obvious. The internet is being rebuilt around people. We used to always build an internet around pages and destinations. And the idea was that me and you go to the New York Times, and we both got to see the exact same thing because it's a page and we're people. What we're seeing is a gradual shift. Most products now map themselves to people. Most content sites are learning that when they go there, and if, you, you know, if Des reads sports, let's show them sports first. The, all that stuff is starting to get really obvious. Um, but the other implication here is that people want to be a part of something. So the reason, like, uh, you know, there's just a core thing. Humans just want to be connected. Every human wants two things. They want to feel unique, and they want to feel connected to other, other people. And <clears throat> for as long as there's been computers, we've been trying to make people connect through computers. And we can see this if we go all the way back, right? 1973, talk to Matic, right? This was the slack of its day, if you like. Didn't quite get the $5 billion valuation, but this was talked to Matic in 73. In 81, we had like this, uh, what's it called again? The CompuServe CB simulator. This is like a close version of IRC, which is effectively a type of Slack. Because remember, the jobs people try to do don't change. The ways you can do them change all the time. So <clears throat> messaging has finally blown up because of mobile, because of the internet, because of things like push. It's now got, got, to, you know, got to a point where you can reach somebody in Australia instantly with a single tap of a button. And that kind of happened, and we didn't really notice it. But it, it's why messaging is huge. So <clears throat> here's the top 10 messaging apps. And as you can see, even the shit ones you've never heard of are growing. You know? That's how big messaging is. <laughs> right? 
And Zuck said this recently. What he said was like, he said, messaging is the only thing we've found people do more often than social networking, which is why we have all these damn messengers, right? Every single product there, with the exception of the bottom ones, is a messenger. Everyone's chasing, the, like, they want to be the next WhatsApp, basically, right? They want to get their $19 billion payout. But messaging has just exploded. Now, what that means is we're all spending our time on messaging type products. And if you're a product maker, there's implications there because your users aren't in your product anymore. They're probably in Facebook Messenger or in Slack or somewhere else talking to their friends. So the product now needs to be a part of the conversation. So if you and me are having a talk about what pizza we should order or what movie we should go to, that means Domino's and Fandango need to be in this conversation. They need to be there with us rather than it being a separate destination that we then go over to and then jump back over to our message and carry on. That's what we're seeing right now. And uh, this shift is being sort of described by Chris Messina, who, amongst other things, invented the hashtag, which you're all using, which I love. Uh, but uh, uh, he calls it like conversational commerce. This idea that commerce can happen as a byproduct of a conversation. If I'm talking to you about shoes, shoes can appear. Why, is that, why shouldn't that be the case, right? We're talking about the shoes. We shouldn't have to go to the shoe place and then come back. That's not how the real world works. So there's a few interesting shifts here, but one of them is like just simple messaging UI make it cheaper, faster, easier for your customers to make progress in their lives.